Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Mark Landers. I'm the CFO and COO of Early Shares. I will be your moderator today. Welcome to this Early Shares, seminar, uh, Early Shares webinar titled Equity Crowdfunding Comes of Age, The New Rules for Raising Capital. Before we get started, I would like to get the disclaimer out of the way. The information which is being shared with you today seeks and may answer some questions of yours related to Capital 2 and the developments which are being observed within the online platform industry, but is not intended as a comprehensive analysis of the topic or situations directly impacting you and any of your existing operations. In addition, this information should not be relied upon as legal advice. There are only general observations at this time. You are encouraged to speak with your own securities counsel. Your counsel may analyze the same facts and rules differently and come to drastically different conclusions and recommendations for you. Please visit www.sec.gov for more information. This information is supplied from sources we believe to be reliable, but we cannot guarantee its accuracy. This presentation is made solely for the interest of the participants on this call and should in no way be relied upon or construed as legal advice. For specific information on particular factual situations, an opinion of your legal counsel be sought. So now that we have the disclaimer out of the way, I would like to introduce our speakers. Firstly, Joanna Schwartz is the CEO of Early Shares. For those of you who may not be familiar with Early Shares, we are an equity and reward-based funding platform founded in anticipation of the Jobs Act, the goal of transforming how capital is allocated to small business in the United States. Joanna joined Early Shares this past spring. Prior to Early Shares, she had a varied career leading financial services, technology, product distribution, and e-commerce businesses. As the founder of commercial mortgage lender Silver Hill Financial, she grew the business to over $1 billion in annual origination volume to underserved market sectors. She is also an active angel investor and has participated as an advisor to multiple technology, real estate, and e-commerce businesses. Our second speaker is Doug Elanoff. Doug is a member of Eleanor Grossman and Scholl LLP, a 60-lawyer New York-based firm. Doug has been a member of the firm since its founding in 1992. He is a corporate and securities attorney with a specialty in business transactions and corporate financing. Doug and the rest of the corporate department distinguish, distinguish themselves from many other transactional lawyers on the basis of their ability to be part of the establishment of new security programs, including crowdfunding, where the firm's professionals have played leadership roles within each of those industries, assisting in the creation, formation, and strategies relating to those, those financings, as well as working closely with the regulatory agencies, including the SEC and FINRA, and the listing exchange, exchanges, Amex and NASDAQ. We have been fortunate that Doug and his team have represented Early Shares since inception and have guided the development of our investment process, and we thank him for his participation today. With that, I hand it over to Joanna to get us started. Thanks, Mark, and hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here today. We are um, just extremely excited about uh, the changes in the law that went into effect yesterday, and we are really looking forward to sharing all of those details with you. Um, we're going to try to keep this moving fast today. Um, we've got a Q&A session up on uh, the webinar, and we will do our best time permitting to answer those questions at the end of the session. Uh, basically what we're going to do today is we're going to start with some of the basics and the context of the JOBS Act. It's always kind of nice to understand where we were to understand where we're going. Um, we're going to talk about the changes that went into effect this week, and um, Doug, we're so happy that he's joining us, is going to really go into a lot of the details on the regulations and, and really what those mean for all of us. Um, we're going to also talk about proposed rules that are um, 
potentially uh, on the deck for the future. And then we're going to talk about how all of that works with early shares and how we are implementing that in our business and how you guys can interact with us as we move forward. So a, a little bit of context here, and you know, uh, some of you obviously are very familiar with the JOBS Act. Others of you are, are listening to this for the first time. But as you know, um, the, the JOBS Act really was, uh, was created for what it means. It's an acronym that means Jumpstart Our Business Startup Act. And it was created to do exactly that. Um, it seeks to accomplish that goal by facilitating the ability for small businesses to raise capital. And as we, as we know, small businesses really are the driver of the U.S. economy. And those businesses having access to capital to grow is a key of indicator of their ability to be successful. Almost 100% of the businesses in the, in the country, 99.7 according to the SBA, are actually classified as small businesses. They account for over 64% of our private sector jobs. And yet the chance of those businesses, their ability to secure capital is, continues to be extremely limited by traditional funding sources that just haven't adapted to um, the needs of the small businesses. The chance of securing capital through a traditional angel funding or venture source remains in the very low single digits. And after the credit crisis in particular, the amount of absolute mm -hmm. dollars of loans available to small businesses mm -hmm. and the proportion of those loans in banks that are allocated to small businesses can continue to decline, creating a real capital crunch for these businesses. Now, we don't believe at Early Shares or anywhere that 100% of the businesses that are seeking financing should get it. Certainly that's not the case. Not every business should be funded, but certainly more than 2% of them should be or should have the opportunity to do that. Now, what's interesting is all of these businesses are seeking capital. And, um, and don't have access to it, and yet there's $33 trillion of investable personal savings embedded in our economy that's kind of been trapped because the businesses who have been needing the capital haven't been able to access it from the general population who has that personal savings available mm -hmm. and are willing to mm -hmm. and have a desire to invest in the small businesses in this country. Hence, the JOBS Act and mm -hmm. the promise of the JOBS Act which was uh, put in, uh, in place last year. Now, the JOBS Act did a lot of things. There were, there were several um, initiatives within the JOBS Act that helped um, the capital formation process and help provide small businesses access to capital. But as it relates to our industry, the online funding and capital raising industry, really the two, the two sections are Title III and Title II. Those are the areas that everyone is, is very bullish on. Now Title III, um, we listened to a few of the webinars on this topic um, yesterday and there was a bit of, uh, of confusion about what actually went into effect this week versus what is going to go into effect in the future. So I just want to be really clear here. Title III is still pending. We are still waiting for the SEC to publish the final rules that dictate how Title III is going to be enacted. Title III is really the true version of crowdfunding. It opens up the potential for quote unquote everyday Americans, unaccredited investors, to be allowed to invest in the small business opportunities available to them. Uh, up until that point when that is initiated, all of the private placements are still only available to accredited investors. Accredited investors, a very simplified definition, are those individuals who make an annual income of $200,000 a year or have a net worth of over a million dollars not including their primary residence. There's, much, there's more depth to that, but that's the simple reason, so the simple definition. So, um, Title III opens it up beyond that to unaccredited investors, and it gives a, a more streamlined way for small businesses to raise up to a million dollars a year. We are really looking forward to those rules being implemented, but that is not the topic of our conversation today. According to our latest in, um, information from the SEC, we are expecting those rules to be published within you know, the next several months, but uh, that is, that is, we won't know for sure until they're actually published. Now, what we're talking about today was the other portion that is the big change in the JOBS Act that mm -hmm. implement, was implemented as of this week, and that's Title II. Title II lifts the ban on general solicitation, which basically means that companies can now, for the first time ever, uh, or really the first time since the Great Depression, the first time in 80 mm -hmm. years, can advertise their need for capital. 
Um, and if, if you think about it, it makes perfect sense. The most critical need of a small business is mm -hmm. actually having the capital available to them to run that business. And yet, they've been handcuffed all this time with an inability to actually advertise in, in print, in media, um, or even through uh, you know, the press. If, if, someone, if someone who was looking at a small business actually was in the middle of a capital raise, and they were in, interviewed by the press for a story about their business, they weren't even allowed to mention the fact that they were seeking capital. And now that prohibition has been lifted. If you are working underneath certain exemptions in, in the securities law, um, that's Reg Z Rule 506C. Now, even though it is for um, you are allowed to advertise, only accredited investors are still able to invest. So unaccredited investors may hear that message, and I'm sure they will because things will be advertised publicly. But you still need to be an accredited investor to invest in those transactions. Um, and there's other protections built into the law, such as disqualification of bad actors from participating in these capital raids. And then there's also additional rules being um, contemplated by the SEC, which are open for comment and public, public comment right now. And in fact, um, Early Shares has some pretty strong opinions and recommendations related to those rules. And we submitted a letter to the SEC commenting on those. If you're interested in the details related to that, it's posted up on our, on our website. But to go into, I've given you kind of the broad brush here, um, and the real exciting piece about this is now companies who are looking for capital, if they choose to use this exemption, can raise capital in a way that is much more open and enables them to advertise um, and basically shout from the rooftops that they need the capital to run their business. And with that, I happily turn it over to Doug to go into all of the details that you guys might be interested in learning about, um, more specifically, how this can impact your ability to raise capital. Doug? Thanks, jo Thanks Joanna. I actually don't think there's really a need for you to hand it over to me. I think you're doing a great job. Uh, I, I think every, everything I just heard lines up with uh, what I'm about to tell, I'll provide a little more detail. Obviously, there was a lot of confusion yesterday, even in some of the mainstream mainstream mag, uh, magazines and newspapers. Uh, but to be clear, just as Joanna said, we are not talking about Title III, which is the unaccredited investor portion of the JOBS Act. We're not talking about donations. We're not talking about rewards or pre-order, although some of that is currently being conducted on the Early Shares platform in accordance with the way the rules work. We're talking about the extension of how private placements work in this country. So as Joanna mentioned, 506C, which is an exemption under the federal securities laws, permits an issuer, an entrepreneur who's got an investment opportunity to generally solicit uh, to the world at large in the United States, world at large in the United States, I guess that's a little bit of an oxymoron, but you're allowed to generally solicit in the United States uh, to all investors. And as Joanne mentioned, it's going to obviously be observed by unaccredited investors as well as accredited investors, but only accredited investors can invest. So if that's what a general solicitation is, and that's only permissible as of this week, then what was permissible as of last week by definition is that a private placement meant you could not do a general solicitation. You could only receive investment dollars mm -hmm. in a private placement from individuals or institutions that you had a pre-existing and substantial relationship with. That doesn't change. You are still able to pursue what's called a 506B offering the same way as that you always uh, were able to. The SEC on July 10th of this year with a 4 to 1 vote of the commissioners uh, gave the green light to 506C, which now means that any issuer can, uh, in a social media campaign, in the Wall Street Journal, on CNBC, let the world, again the world meaning the U.S. at large, know that you're conducting an offering and you're looking for investors who find that opportunity to be interesting to get in touch with you. The burden, and this is the real shift, puts the emphasis on the entrepreneur now to make sure that those individuals that contact the entrepreneur from the general solicitation 
to make sure that they're accredited as Joanna defined it. The $200,000 a year or the million dollars net worth exclusive of house. And the obligation is called taking reasonable steps to verify accreditation. And that burden is now on the entrepreneur. In a 506B offering, or what was the law of the land until last week, and still permissible, uh, is that an investor can what we call self-certify their accreditation, meaning they can do it on their own. But if you want to take advantage of 506C and all of the benefits that come with that general solicitation, the burden is now on the issuer to confirm by taking reasonable steps that the investor is actually accredited. And you'll see on the screen some of the prescribed ways that the SEC suggests that an entrepreneur can get comfortable that an individual investor is actually accredited. It's not it's non exhaustive way of doing it. The SEC calls it a principle based test, uh, which means that you're supposed to use sophisticated judgment to determine whether or not somebody's actually accredited. The list here, which includes asking for tax returns, which obviously is a good way for determining whether or not somebody has been making the necessary amount of income to satisfy the accreditation test. And then you're also allowed to get a representation from the investor that in the next year they will be making the $200,000 in order to satisfy the test. Or you can undertake a third-party review of the investor's financial profile to get comfortable that they, in fact, are accredited. And that includes reviewing bank statements, brokerage statements, or other documents to confirm that the people, and that's really a net worth verification as opposed to an income statement. Uh, you're allowed to ask your accountant to provide a certification, a confirmation. It could be from a lawyer. It may be from a financial advisor. There's no one-size-fits-all way of verifying. It's reasonable steps to verify, which means that you can't just ask for self-certification, but you actively have to ask intelligent questions to determine whether or not the investor is actually accredited. And the failure to do that, to take those reasonable steps, will result in the exemption being not available for your offering. And there are significant consequences for failure to take reasonable steps to verify. If you have failed to take those verification steps, you will have generally solicited in, a, in violation of the rule, and it would be very difficult to put Humpty Dumpty back together again and say that you did a 506B offering because you didn't take the reasonable steps. So along with the good, comes the responsibility of, taking, of making that third-party verification. And I cannot mm -hmm. emphasize enough, if you are not a securities professional, consult a securities professional. The, while the mm -hmm. private placement exemption that's being provided by the SEC here to generally solicit mm -hmm. is a substantial advancement of an entrepreneur's reach in order to raise more capital, the failure to comply will be met severely by state and federal regulators who will not look kindly for an entrepreneur who just takes in the money, having taken in full advantage of the general solicitation. Uh, as Joanna also mentioned, the bad actor disqualification is something that people are not spending mm -hmm. nearly enough time focused on. The SEC's view is if you want the advantage of 506C, then you must not only do the verification, but you have to make sure that the individuals involved in the, uh, the capital raising do not have a, what we used to call a bad boy or bad actor mm -hmm. background, and it prohibits issuers, underwriters, placement, directors, office, the whole list of folks that you might imagine that would be involved in a financing, not to have a background that uh, that has a criminal conviction, 
has an enforcement action against them or any sort of disqualification that's prescribed by the rules. And again, we would encourage and recommend all entrepreneurs to seek the advice of their counsel to make sure they're not precluded from taking advantage of the uh, of 506 because they have a bad actor background. You can go to the next slide. Uh, whoever's controlling the slide, if you go to the next slide. Do you see the? Okay, I just. You want to jump in, Joanne? No, no, no. Do you do you see the new slide then? Is it the proposed yeah, rules? Okay. Yep. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But I, I want to stop there for a second before I go on to the proposed rules because there, as there's been confusion, as Joanna mentioned yesterday, uh, that Title III somehow was live yesterday, which it's not. So the unaccredited investor portion of what we're uh, we're on Joanna's earlier slides is subject to the SEC proposed rules coming out, and it could be six months to a year from now. The only part of Title II that was voted on July 10th, 4 to 1 by the commissioners, was one, the lifting of the ban on general solicitation so that the 506C offerings are live as of today. The bad actor provisions are in full play as of today. But the rest of what we're about to talk about are proposed rules which may never see the light of day based upon comment letters like early shares and the vast majority of other commenters who have already submitted to the SEC, they are upset with the proposals that are contained uh, in these proposed rules that were only voted on by the commissioners on July 10th, 3 to 2, to even advance these proposed rules. And these proposed rules, in my view, I believe it's shared by early shares, would put a chill on all the benefits that have uh, that will inure it of 506C being in effect. So the first one, the current rule is that you file a Form, 15, a form D uh, 15 days after you've sold the first shares. The proposal is to do it 15 days uh, before you do your general solicitation. That is being hotly contested by the broker-dealer community, by the funding platform community, and many issuers as well. There's the additional burden that's being thought that you have to file a final Form D 30 days after the final sale. Additionally, the SEC is seeking that all general solicitation materials contain legends, and the legends are laid out in the proposed rules. I won't go into the details here, but I would encourage everybody to look at them. Uh, the next provision, the fourth, is that all general solicitation materials would be submitted to the SEC. If you think about the, what that would entail from all the tweeting, the Facebooking, uh, articles and advertisements, I don't know that the SEC has the database to handle all of that. Uh, and that, again, is the subject of, to the industry pushback. And then the last portion, which you don't see in Reg D uh, private placements today, is that if you fail to comply, that you'd have a one-year ban on fundraising if you don't file the Form Ds in accordance with the schedule listed above. And for all, all those proposals are uh, controversial, and while we were uh, final uh, comments were to yesterday. Uh, we will see over the next 30, 60 days uh, whether or not the SEC intends to continue to pursue those suggestions, uh, even though they were voted to be proposed rules. I think uh, there's a good chance that many, if not all of them, end up uh, laying on the cutting floor. Doug, thank you so much for that. And, and everyone, as I mentioned, um, we're going to have some time for some more detailed Q&A uh, at the end for you can ask Doug some more details about this. Um, and just we've had a few questions come chiming in. The webinar will be available on our website. You'll be able to access it after the fact um, if, if you're interested. Um, so now the, the good news about, I know uh, for, for some of you the, the legal details are old hat. You're very familiar with this, and for some of you it's very new and in many cases potentially mind-numbing. Um, so we, 
the good news is, is that early shares, our entire reason for being is that we are here to simplify the complexity that is embedded just inherently in raising equity in general and specifically as it relates to raising equity under, um, under Title II and in the future hopefully Title, title III. Um, so basically what we do is we guide mm -hmm. issuers and investors investors th through the whole process. And again, that disclaimer is always there is that we don't provide legal advice and we always suggest everyone goes to their own counsel to get their own advice. But from a process perspective, we oversee the offering, the due diligence process, um, helping issuers understand what they need to supply, helping investors understand what they need to review, and the process of regulatory filing. So if some of those proposed rules that Doug mentioned go into effect in terms of the Form D filings, the timing of those filings, all of that will be facilitated through our platform. Investor verification, in verifying, Doug mentioned that the verification, the onus of making sure that an investor is accredited, the onus is actually on the company accepting that investment. Now, if you're doing a, generally, a general solicitation on your own, not through a platform, and then you begin accepting investments, of course that's something that you can do, but you're going to have to go through those reasonable steps that Doug laid out to verify that your investors are accredited. If you work with a platform like Early Shares, we will manage that process for you, working with third-party providers that assist and validate using those reasonable steps to verify that Doug mentioned. Um, we also facilitate the offering doc process, and then also all of the marketing and social tools and reach that helps you um, get your offering out to the public. And of course the investor relations communication that continues to link these new investors with um, the issuing companies. And so at a very high level, um, an issuer, the process is probably not that unexpected. You, you come onto our platform, you register as a user, and you submit an initial application to the company. And we have a, a, a very um, a sophisticated screening process that we go through to establish whether or not a company um, should go on to the next step in the process. And um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, only 2% of, of companies get, get funding. And, and that not everyone should get funding, this is our very initial screening process to really screen out the companies that are potentially not serious enough or not advanced enough in the process to begin raising capital. Um, if they do pass that process, we assign an early shares account manager to, the, to that account, and they begin the com you know, uh, personal conversations with those, with those potential issuers and begin the due diligence process. And um, we uh, do due diligence through our broker-dealer partner, that's National Securities. Um, and also, depending on the deal structure, through National Securities or through um, another third party, um, and then we work with the issuer to handle uh, the legal and the deal docs, working with any attorneys that get pulled into the mix here. And we facilitate the preparation of the offering page that goes online, um, enabling investor uh, issuers to set permissions, and we understand that privacy and confidentiality is, is potentially a huge um, a gating factor for being willing to post your issue online. And so we provide the issuers with a lot of tools and a lot of safety nets so that they can ensure that only people that they are comfortable with seeing all of their um, confidential information can see it. Um, they have an ability to interact with the people who are requesting access prior to giving them access. Um, and, and everyone signs a confidentiality agreement, um, a, a truncated confidentiality agreement um, prior to seeing all of the details. Um, then they invite their investors. Um, at the, once they pass due diligence, the campaign goes live. Um, from an investor perspective, um, the, you know, the, the, the process is, is also fairly uh, complete and simple in the context of the complexity of, of making investments. You register. Um, we, ha we do have a self-accreditation process online. Everyone needs to go through that before they can request access to see um, the, the offers that are online. Once they, they can self-accredit to see the offer, but in order to invest, once you click invest and you go through, you've done due diligence, you find a deal you like, you've done due diligence, you decide you want to commit to it, at the point of actually making the investment prior to that, 
That's when additional information needs to be submitted to the third party where the verification of your accreditation is going to happen. And only until that happens will your investment actually be deemed, uh, be deemed complete. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, due to the confidentiality on the issuer side, um, investors do need to request access in order to gain access to each deal. Um, and then everyone, all the information is there to conduct um, a, a, a very thorough due diligence for, uh, for the offer. And of course, as always, we tell you to feel free and encourage you to do anything above and beyond what's on the site to be able to feel comfortable um, prior to making that investment decision. And so that's a very high level process. Um, in the next few weeks, our deals are going to be up on the site, and you're going to have an opportunity to um, participate in some of the first offerings that we are going to be uh, presenting to the public um, as an issuer and as an investor. Um, what to expect from us in the future? We're going to be doing a lot more of these educational uh, seminars. So whenever there's a regulatory update, um, you'll be sure to hear from us. And we're going to also be um, putting, um, in terms of webinars and podcasts, a lot of educational sessions in, um, and updating our university. Um, we are going to be doing cap the full uh, spectrum of capital raises from low dollar amounts to, to um, multi-million dollar amounts. We're doing them in a variety of ways, both direct into the companies and as funds. Um, we're doing a, a broad array of industries, and we're really excited because we're, we're diving into some areas that are going to be extremely interesting, um, in particular doing some very creative stuff on the music industry through our, our platform, Early Shares Music, um, and also going to be launching a real estate portal in the near future. Um, you should expect some new partnerships, some creative equity and reward combination campaigns, and um, and you know it's basically stay tuned for lots of additional uh, excitement on early shares as these laws uh, come into implementation and they begin to be, be absorbed by uh, by the small business community and we begin to see a tremendous amount of activity. And with that, I'm going to turn back to Mark, um, who I believe has a bunch of questions that he is going to uh, share with us, and, and Doug and I will do our best to answer. Great. Thanks, Joanna. Yes, uh, 